section fifteen of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter thirteen prepared for action a message sent to the cartagenian commodore his contemptuous reply the supple jack brings the corvette to action and takes her sinks a brig and captures three schooners murray visits the cartagenan general and demands the liberation of the prisoners an ominous reply the boats were manned and every preparation made for the intended expedition the danger was great but lieutenant murray determined to risk everything for the sake of the object even had he not been deeply interested he would not have allowed the insult to the british flag to pass unquestioned his small crew were in high spirits determined to dare and do everything to rescue the young lady and the midshipmen they at all events the cartagenians had no right to detain whatever might have been the case with regard to the colonel and the officers and the crews of the merchant vessels just then some cat's paws were seen playing over the mirror-like surface of the ocean the sails bulged out and the supple jack began to slip through the water she soon reached the boat which was picked up and then making all sail she sped onwards towards cartagena the glory of cartagena like that of many another place in those regions has departed though in appearance picturesque as in days of yore situated on several islets with green trees rising amid its towers and spires backed by its citadel and curiously shaped hill with the popa convent like the high stern of a ship on the top the town itself is surrounded by walls and batteries which look not a little formidable at a distance formidable though they might be murray resolved that they should not prevent him from carrying out his intentions in a short time the corvette was seen at anchor in the outer harbour desmond and needham had completely recovered and begged to be allowed to land and act as guides should the boats be sent on shore i scarcely think that they will attempt to interfere with us said lieutenant murray but it is as well to be ready have all clear for action mr higson ay ay sir answered higson giving the necessary orders with no little satisfaction i only hope that they will dare to set up their backs we'll show them what our long gun and two short bulldogs can do he said as he went along the deck the men were eager for a fight as british sailors always are though they mustered all told only sixty men officers and crew included the breeze was somewhat light but sufficient to give the brig good steerage way before however attempting to use force lieutenant murray determined to try pacific measures he accordingly hove the brig to outside the mouth of the harbour a boat was lowered and manned and he directed higson accompanied by desmond to go on board the corvette and demand of the cartagenian commodore the instant liberation of the prisoners you are to go on shore and communicate with the consul and then return on board as soon as possible he added higson replied that he perfectly understood his instructions and with no small satisfaction at the prospect of something to do shoved off from the brig's side needham who went as one of the crew had described how they had been treated and it was the general belief that the commodore would give them an opportunity of teaching him and his countrymen better manners the commodore seems a mighty proud sort of fellow and when he sees only our small brig he'll not be inclined to accede to mr murray's demand i've a notion said desmond then i'll just give him a hint my boy that he may chance to receive a visit from the rest of the squadron answered higson those sort of fellows are apt to bluster and boast and like mongrels bark loud enough when they see another cur run from them but they seldom dare to bite when they are attacked the corvette however carries sixteen guns though i cannot say how she is manned observed desmond 
she may carry twenty guns for what i care answered higson laughing the question is how will they be fought our long tom will be a match for all of them depend on that we shall do our best to get ahead or astern of her where her shot will find it difficult to reach us but then there is the brig and there are two or three schooners in addition observed desmond though we don't see them as they are some way up the harbour they're sure to come down to help their consort we must settle her first and then tackle them said higson it is probable however that the commodore will knock under and not give us the opportunity of showing what we can do i would rather see miss o'regan and rogers and gordon with the old colonel safe first said desmond i am afraid that the commodore will be ill treating them in revenge should we give his vessels a drubbing the consul seemed somewhat of a slow coach or he would have found out what had happened long ago and applied for our liberation the breeze carried the boat which was standing in under sail swiftly on she's a fine craft and has eight guns on a side observed higson as they got close to the corvette the sail was lowered and a voice hailed in spanish to know what they wanted higson who guessed the meaning of the hail standing up pointed to the british ensign astern and said that he had dispatches to deliver no rope was however hove to them nor was the side manned so followed by desmond and needham in no very dignified fashion he scrambled on board there's the commodore said desmond pointing to a middle-aged gaunt-looking don who was walking the deck with his cocked hat stuck ferociously on one side and that fat officer is our friend the first lieutenant if they don't know how to be civil we'll show them and stepping aft he made them both a profound bow and introduced higson the dons instinctively took off their hats unable to withstand the influence of the young midshipman's politeness higson handed his dispatches to the commodore who opened the envelope but unable to read english he turned to his first lieutenant and asked him the meaning of the paper the latter confessed his inability to make it out for though he spoke a little english he was unable to read it as was possibly the case with regard to his own language higson therefore explained that the dispatches came from the commander of the man-of-war outside the harbour who requested that the british subjects now held in captivity by the cartagenians might at once be delivered up to him the commodore to whom the lieutenant interpreted what higson said replied that he could not give an immediate reply that the dispatch being written in english he could not comprehend it and as to delivering up the prisoners that was a matter on which his government must decide he had therefore no reply to make to the english officer who must take the consequences should he venture into the harbour this was the sum total of the answer given by the commodore through his first lieutenant though it took a considerable time to deliver tell the commodore then said higson that as this is a friendly port my commander will certainly come into it as he wishes to communicate with our consul to whom he intends rendering assistance in obtaining the liberation of the prisoners what does he mean by that exclaimed the commodore when the answer was interpreted to him if he attempts to use force he will find that the honour of those in whose veins flows the pure blood of castile is not to be trifled with and the don stamped and fumed and strutted about the deck drawing his sword and flourishing it over his head as if his ship was about that moment to be boarded by the english desmond reckless of the consequences which might have ensued burst into a fit of laughter what does the boy mean exclaimed the commodore advancing with threatening gestures towards him just tell your captain that my companion is an irish midshipman it's a curious habit he's got of laughing at anything which tickles his fancy and he cannot mean to be disrespectful to so great a hero the first lieutenant explained what higson had said and possibly saved the midshipman from being then and there run through the body by the irate don then i am to understand that this is the message i am to carry back to my commander said higson to the fat officer yes and i hope your commander is a wise man and will not venture into the harbour was the reply 
i'll answer that he will though exclaimed higson making a profound bow so good morning don whiskerandos as the commodore turning his back strutted aft fuming as before higson shaking hands with the first lieutenant exclaimed i wish that we may have the chance of meeting as friends another time for you're a good fellow that you are he and desmond then beat a retreat to the gangway the lieutenant was so pleased with the last remark that he ordered side ropes to be shipped and the side to be manned and the english officers took their departure in a rather more dignified manner than they had arrived there seems a good chance of our having a brush with the dons observed desmond as soon as they had shoved off and were pulling for the shore perhaps the consul will settle matters but if not i'm very certain that mr murray will stand no nonsense answered higson no opposition was made to their landing and desmond and needham easily found their way to the british consulate for some reason the consul had not returned and their friend the vice-consul said that he had used every effort to obtain the liberation of the prisoners but in vain he was evidently in a great state of alarm and confessed that he feared the worst he had however been assured that the young lady and the two midshipmen should be properly treated although the authorities were very angry at hearing of the escape of desmond and his companion and he advised them to get back to the boat as fast as possible feeling assured that if recognized they would be recaptured the fellows had better not attempt it with the english flag over their heads exclaimed higson however we will get back and make our report to our commander if you can manage the matter and let them know that we are in earnest he may possibly draw in his horns the vice-consul shrugged his shoulders and higson and his party got back to the boat and pulled out as fast as the crew could bend to their oars towards the supplejack higson was anxious to be on board for he was very sure that no time was to be lost murray on hearing his report was not long in determining what to do we must go in and insist on the liberation of our friends he said i am sure my lad you'll stand by me a cheer from the crew showed that they were in the right spirit to dare and do anything that he might require the head-yards were braced round and the helm put up and the brig stood boldly into the harbour murray intended to pass the corvette and bring up as near the town as the water would allow the corvette in the meantime had got a spring on her cable her ports were open and her guns run out the little supple jack stood on nothing daunted i don't think that don whiskerandos will dare to stop us though he boasted so much when we were on board observed desmond to higson you're mistaken my boy higson had just time to reply when a broadside from the corvette came hissing through the air one shot only however struck the brig and shot away her forestay we must not allow this to pass unnoticed exclaimed murray reserve your fire however my lads till i give the order the long gun was pointed at the corvette the port carronade was run over to the starboard side murray waited till the brig had got directly ahead of the enemy blaze away now my lads he shouted and a raking fire from his three guns was poured into the corvette sweeping her deck fore and aft the wind being light and the brig's courses being clued up she glided slowly through the water and the guns were again loaded and fired into the bows of the corvette before the latter could return another shot the brig had just way enough on her to go about the long gun was slewed round and the others run over to the port side and fired greatly to the astonishment of the corvette's crew before they had managed to bring their guns to bear on her when they did their shot flew wide or through her rigging and not one hit her the brig was now almost stationary her crew working with a will fired all their guns twice before the spaniards had returned another shot well done my lads cried higson we have given them as many shots as they have sent at us such was the case and every shot from the brig had told with good effect a few more as well aimed and the dons depend on it will cry he added 
the crew stripped to the waist were indeed working their guns with right good will all hands on board were employed some loading and firing others bringing up powder and shot from below and the rest attending to the sails the smoke which there was scarcely sufficient air to blow away enveloped the combatants and prevented those at a distance from being able to discern which was likely to be the victor murray and his crew however very well knew how matters went the splinters which flew from the corvette's side and the shrieks and cries which came from her deck showed the fearful effect their fire was producing on their antagonist at last one gun was silent and then another and then only three replied to them murray cheered on his men who although perspiring at every pore ran their guns in and out with as good a will as at first by this time the brig had drifted still closer to her foe once more long tom was fired loaded with langrage which swept with fearful effect across the deck of the corvette not a shot came from her in return the brig's guns were however again loaded but just before the triggers were pulled down came the corvette's ensign a loud cheer burst from the throats of the british crew murray was on the point of anchoring intending to send a boat on board to take possession when a brig was seen dropping down the harbour and followed by three schooners favoured by a light breeze off shore see my lads here come more of them he cried in a cheery voice we will settle them however as we have done the corvette ay ay sir that we will shouted the voices of his gallant fellows you wouldn't say so if you didn't intend it he answered well try and see how quickly we can finish them off the brig was some way ahead of the schooners and murray anxious to engage her before their arrival put the brig about assisted by the light breeze which just then filled her sails her commander not aware that the corvette had struck her colours was little prepared for the reception he was to meet with as soon as murray had got this fresh foe within range of his long gun he opened fire the shot well aimed went crashing through her side the second shot was fired before she got near enough for the carronades to reach her the belief that the english brig had only one long gun prevented the cartagenians from attempting to escape the next time long tom was fired his shot was attended by two from the carronades the enemy replied with her broadside but most of her shot went flying over the supple jack while others fell ahead or astern of her wide of their mark not one of long tom's shot missed most of them striking between wind and water and as she drew nearer they told with still greater effect at last the enemy put about and attempted to run up the harbour vain were her efforts to escape the last shot striking her gave her her death-blow with her canvas all set and colours flying gradually she sank till the water washed over her decks and her crew were seen scrambling aloft leaving the wounded to their fate within ten minutes of the time she got into action her topmasts alone appeared above the surface just before this the three schooners had come up and had opened their fire but none of their shot had struck the supple jack and their commander seeing the fate of their consorts came to the conclusion that discretion was the better part of valour and hauled down their flags amid the cheers of the british crew murray lowered his boats and sent them to pick up any of the brig's crew who might have been unable to escape aloft the lives of several were thus saved the schooners also sent their boats and took off the men from the rigging the supple jack then stood back for the corvette murray directed higson and desmond to take possession their fat friend the first lieutenant received them at the gangway with his hat in one hand and his sword in the other there was no bluster in him now where is the commodore asked higson looking round the deck which was strewed with dead men there answered the lieutenant pointing to the mangled form of a man which lay on the quarter-deck his uniform alone showing that it was that of the commodore he had been almost cut in two by a shot from long tom how many men have you lost asked higson twenty-five answered the lieutenant our crew declared that they were fighting with devils and not men and refused to fire another shot if they had handled their guns as our fellows did theirs we shouldn't have taken you so easily answered higson you deserve a better ship's company 
many thanks for your compliment answered the crestfallen lieutenant it is the fortune of war the schooners being brought up close to the corvette the supple jack anchored near them with long tom so trained that should the cartagenians attempt to recapture their vessels they might quickly be sent to the bottom the brig's boarding nettings were also triced up a vigilant watch was kept and pistols pikes and cutlasses placed in readiness for immediate use to resist any attack which might be made on her murray while he thus kept watch over the captured vessels felt himself in a delicate and trying position the cartagenian government had hostages in their hands on whom they might wreak their vengeance had they indeed known how dear one of the prisoners was to the young commander they would probably have made use of the advantage they possessed he felt sure that a bold course was the only safe one he might have led his crew on shore and endeavoured to rescue the captives but the attempt he knew would have been sheer madness as a piece of artillery at the end of one of the streets might have sent him and his men to destruction murray like a wise man had retired to his cabin to consider what was best to be done he speedily made up his mind and sent for his second in command higson he said i have resolved to go on shore myself and demand the release of the prisoners i leave you in charge of the brig keep an eye on the corvette and schooners and sink them rather than allow them to escape you may depend on it that we will sir was the answer i only wish that we could get our friends on board that we might stand in and batter their town about the ears of the rascals they have had a pretty severe lesson already said murray and i have hopes that they will not refuse to accede to my demands get the gig ready with an ensign and a flag of truce there is no time to be lost higson went on deck and the gig's crew were piped away i say higson do ask the captain if i may accompany him there's a good fellow said desmond perhaps i may be of some use in getting miss o'regan and our fellows out of the prison i don't know how you'll do that answered higson nor do i said desmond but at all events i know the way into it and i think if mr murray will take needham as well he and i would manage somehow or other to get our friends out if they are still in the room in which we left them murray to gerald's great satisfaction consented to take him and needham he had borrowed a new uniform from one of the midshipmen on board and no one was likely to recognize him so different did he look from what he had done in the dirty worn-out clothes in which he had escaped from the prison murray steered directly for the landing-place and boldly stepped on shore regardless of the crowd collected to gaze at the commander of the daredevil englishman who had so quickly beaten their fleet they however treated him with respect drawing back on either side to allow him a free passage as he marched with his flag and attendants towards the consul's house he found that functionary and the vice-consul in a state of great agitation you have indeed captain taught the government here a lesson which they will not easily forget but i am afraid that you have overdone it general carmona sent to warn me that on the first shot fired he would shoot all his prisoners and i greatly fear that he has carried out his threat surely he would not dare to murder colonel o'regan and his daughter and the english midshipmen exclaimed murray his voice trembling with agitation i scarcely dare to say what he may have done answered the consul he is a villain of the first water and would shoot his own father and mother if they offended him murray could scarcely speak for some time so overpowering were his feelings by a great effort he recovered himself and said i must beg you to accompany me at once to the general and i will insist on seeing him it was evident that neither the consul nor vice-consul liked the duty imposed on them but they could not refuse to comply with the young commander's request the ladies of the latter's family evidently thought that he was going on a dangerous expedition as they clung round him weeping as if they were parting from him for ever pray don't be alarmed exclaimed patty desmond who did not see anything so very hazardous in the undertaking depend on it your respected papa will come back with a whole skin and if not we shall have the satisfaction of knocking the city down over the ears of its inhabitants the young ladies who had not before recognized patty now knew him by the sound of his voice what they all cried out together are you the young officer who got out of prison in such a wonderful way the people affirmed that you got out with the help of a magician as they had never discovered how you made your escape and the jailer who declares that you were safely shut up when he last visited you swears that it is impossible you should have done so either by the door or windows 
how we escaped i'll tell you by and by but pray excuse me for the present as your papa and the consul are ready to start answered gerald this conversation took place while the vice-consul was putting on his uniform coat and with the aid of his wife buckling his sword-belt round the wide circuit of his waist murray and the two officials then sent forth desmond carrying the flag of truce and needham the british ensign that flag which every nation of the earth has learnt to respect though some may regard it with no very friendly feelings after a walk of about twenty minutes they reached general carmona's residence in front of the building was drawn up a guard of soldiers who cast scowling glances at the party as they advanced in a short time an officer appeared who promised to announce their arrival to the general they were then conducted into a courtyard and told to wait the officer soon returned and led the way to a large hall with a long table in the centre at the end of which sat a personage in military uniform with several officers collected round him some seated and others standing about talking eagerly together to what cause am i indebted for the honour of this visit asked the general who rose with his officers as murray and the consuls entered this officer the commander of the british man-of-war now in the harbour comes to demand the liberation of certain subjects of the queen of england detained by your government as prisoners answered the consul introducing lieutenant murray the general a tall cadaverous personage with long moustaches sticking out on either side of his face tried to look very fierce and important but ill succeeded in concealing his trepidation and annoyance i might rather ask why the english brig of war has sunk one of my vessels and captured the remainder of my fleet though it seems a miracle to me how it should have happened tell him said murray as this answer was interpreted that as his corvette fired into the queen of england's brig it was my duty to punish her for her audacity and that if my demands are not complied with i intend to blow up the remainder of his squadron and then to bombard the town as the consul interpreted this speech the general and his officers exhibited the most unfeigned astonishment at the bold threat which the commander of the three-gun brig had made tell him that i mean what i say added murray observing the evident consternation of the mongrel spaniards and seeing that now was the time to carry matters with a high hand what prisoners are they you wish us to liberate asked the general all the british subjects you lately captured on board two merchantmen in the harbour of sapote two of them being officers of the queen of england's navy with other passengers the rest being officers and crews of the two vessels the vessels were captured while engaged in illegal practices and some of the prisoners you speak of it is beyond my power to deliver into your hands answered general carmona the vessels and those on board them were legally condemned we must settle about the equity of their seizure afterwards said murray my duty in the meantime is to obtain the restoration of the vessels and the liberation of those of whom i have spoken i regret to inform you that some of them have met the fate they deserve of traitors and rebels and have been shot answered the general mustering up his courage to make this announcement shot exclaimed murray in a tone of deep anxiety as the consul interpreted the general's last remark inquire who they are that have been thus treated said murray the officers and others found on board the two vessels the common seamen were not worth the powder and shot or they would have met the same fate answered the general with as much sang froid as he could command murray could hardly restrain his indignation on hearing this for he could not doubt that colonel o'regan was among the sufferers he thought especially of the grief into which stella would be plunged and he was more than ever resolved to carry matters with a high hand tell the general that his ships are under the guns of my brig and that i have left orders with the officers in command to blow them up should i not return with the prisoners within two hours you speak very boldly sir exclaimed the general suppose i were to treat you as i have done your countrymen shoot you then my countrymen would very soon arrive with their ships of war and not only knock your town about your ears but hang up you and every officer they may catch at their yard arms answered murray the spaniards so they may be called pulled their moustaches and the remark had evidently its due effect i must insist also that the two vessels captured by your squadron be brought into this harbour and anchored astern of my brig before to-morrow evening i give you until then as the winds are light but there must be no delay 
now general i must have your answer as time is passing or before long we shall have your vessels blown into the air i require the immediate liberation of all the prisoners still alive with regard to the rest my government will settle with you by and by and murray took out his watch and carelessly held it up so that the general and his officers might see the time the action had an electric effect on all present the general held a brief consultation with his officers and though he attempted to bluster a little they agreed forthwith to give up the prisoners you have got on admirably captain observed the consul as he and his companions left the hall your mode of proceeding will always be successful when practised on people like those with whom we have at present to deal and on a larger scale probably with most of the nations of the earth End of chapter 13section sixteen of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter fourteen tom and archie in prison their trick on the jailer soldiers appear taken from prison meet colonel o'regan march through the town prisoners going to execution distant cannonading heard the firing party death of colonel o'regan the midshipmen tried to help him carried back to prison they and stella liberated by murray we must return to the night when gerald desmond and needham made their escape from the prison as soon as they were gone tom rogers and archie gordon set to work on the bar and by hauling and pulling gradually worked it back into its former position they then stuck on the rust as before and swept the windows clear of the filings and remaining bits of rust which might have betrayed them now miss o'regan do lie down and take some rest said tom ever thoughtful of others you need it much already and you cannot tell what fatigue you may have shortly to go through i have hopes that before long we shall get out of prison and in the meantime it will puzzle the jailer to know how our friends have escaped unless he happens to hit upon this bar and that i hope he will not do tom and archie returned to their own room the longer the jailers remain ignorant of the escape of desmond and needham the better observed tom i think that i can contrive to rig up two figures which may help to do so fortunately needham has left his red handkerchief behind him that must serve as his nightcap i will make the head of straw and cover it with my handkerchief the body we must form by heaping up the straw and then throwing a rug over it now archie your handkerchief must serve as desmond's head and we will put your cap on the top of it gordon of course agreed to the proposal they set to work at once and as far as the pale light of the moon which came through the windows could enable them to judge they were well satisfied with their performance they then lay down to sleep with clear consciences on their own somewhat diminished heaps of straw the jailer who brought their breakfast seldom did more than put it in at the door being satisfied with a glance round the room at its four inmates he looked in as was his custom the following morning and seeing two figures in the dark corners of the room supposed that the seamen and one of the midshipmen were indulging in a longer sleep than usual tom and archie put their hands to their heads and shook them as much as to say that their friends were suffering from headache this seemed to satisfy the jailer who departed much to the satisfaction of the midshipmen without making a closer inspection at all events it shows that our friends have not been caught or we should have had the room searched observed tom i hope that they have found the consulate and if so we shall probably be liberated before the day is over i wish however we could hear something about the colonel for the sake of his poor daughter the midshipmen naturally had got very weary at being so long shut up their spirits however now rose at the thoughts of their speedy liberation and they made a hearty meal off their somewhat coarse fare 
a couple of hours or more passed when polly knocked at the door and said that miss o'regan would be glad to see them i have been thinking more than ever about my poor father she said and i cannot help fearing from the remarks let drop by the jailer's wife that he must be very ill i have in vain begged her to let me go and see him can you think of any plan by which i may do so if the old lady would take me down into the common cell i would gladly consent to be shut up with him perhaps by putting our heads together we may hit upon some plan for getting the colonel up here to see you answered tom that would be much better for you can have no idea of the set of ruffians you would have to meet in the lower prison and i am very sure that the colonel would not allow you to be among them all sorts of schemes were discussed the chief hope was that they might work on the feelings of the jailer's wife who was evidently well disposed towards them they had been talking for some time when hearing footsteps coming along the passage the midshipmen hurried back to their own room instead of the jailer however as the door opened a party of soldiers with fixed bayonets appeared what can be these fellows want exclaimed archy the soldiers forthwith marched into the room and without speaking began to fasten the midshipmen's arms behind them this doesn't look pleasant cried tom i say you fellows what are you about the soldiers made no reply but continued lashing their arms for in the meantime had walked up to the corner where they expected to find the other prisoners their astonishment was very great when they found instead only some heaps of straw they talked for a minute together casting looks at tom and archy which betokened no good will one of them having gone out came back with the jailer who began questioning them though as they scarcely understood a word he said they were not very well able to give lucid replies they of course guessed however that he was making inquiries as to what had become of their companions they will be back soon i dare say said tom if you will let us wait till then we shall be much obliged to you non intende answered the jailer not in ten days exclaimed tom even at that moment unable to refrain from a joke the jailer not being a bit the wiser for tom's reply began to stamp and rave and then repeated his questions in a louder voice expecting that by so doing he should elicit an answer at last he and four of the soldiers went into miss o'regan's room and while two of them cross-questioned her and polly as to what had become of the missing prisoners the others searched the room in the hopes of discovering them their answers did not satisfy the men for like true women having determined that they would not say what had become of their friends nothing could induce them to acknowledge that they knew anything about the matter fortunately the soldiers did not think of examining the bars as it did not occur to them that the fugitives had escaped by the window at last they came back looking very disheartened four of the soldiers roughly dragging the midshipmen into the passage led them downstairs they were then conducted into a courtyard where a number of other prisoners were collected some heavily manacled and others with their arms secured as theirs were by ropes they looked round and before long recognized colonel o'regan as also the masters mates and men of the two merchantmen there were besides a number of prisoners in military uniform whose countenances all wore an agitated and anxious expression though some tried to hold up their heads and to look indifferent as to the fate awaiting them all the englishmen were manacled as though their captors supposed that they would make an attempt to escape the midshipmen would scarcely have known colonel o'regan had it not been for his dress and his tall commanding figure so pale and haggard had he become their guards not stopping them they made their way up to him he recognized them with a smile of satisfaction what are they going to do with us colonel o'regan asked tom naturally beginning to feel more nervous than at first to murder us i fear answered the colonel in a low voice for myself 
i care not but for her and for you my heart bleeds tell me young gentlemen where is she how does she bear up against the cruel fate which has overtaken her i have been unable to learn anything about her since i was shut up in that horrid den with these ruffians the poor colonel was somewhat relieved at hearing that his daughter was not ill-treated and that her black maid was allowed to remain with her tom told him also of the kindness of the jailer's wife she is not ungrateful then for a slight service i once did her little thinking at the time how it would be repaid he remarked poor girl these barbarians would not allow me even a last parting farewell with her but do you really suppose that there is no hope for us colonel o'regan exclaimed tom surely they will not dare to shoot us for myself i certainly expect no mercy answered the colonel gloomily i have however hopes that though they may not be influenced by pity for you and your companion they will hesitate before they injure those clad in the uniform of the british navy i do not therefore despair of your lives and though i cannot plead for myself i will for you their conversation was cut short by the arrival of an officer who gave orders to the guard to conduct the prisoners to the campo outside the town tom rejoined archy gordon and they followed the colonel who was marched out with captain crowhurst as his companion they were joined by several priests with crucifixes in their hands who addressing the prisoners as they walked alongside them offered to afford them the consolations of their religion we want none of their mummery exclaimed captain crowhurst in a tone of indignant contempt do tell the fellows colonel to let us alone the colonel instead of interpreting this speech mildly addressed the priests and assured them that he and his companions did not require their services as they differed in creed the friars now came to tom and archy but soon finding that they did not understand a word they said they fell back to those in the rear the master of the sloop and the mates spoke much in the same tone as captain crowhurst had done and the priests observing that they were heretics devoted their attention to their own countrymen two of the priests more persevering than the rest returned again to the colonel he motioned them aside with the same courteousness as before still they addressed him my friends he said at length i give you full credit for the honesty of your intentions but as i have lived so i hope to die protesting against the false system and erroneous doctrines in which you appear to believe i have no faith in them and therefore you only interrupt a person who would ask strength from one in whose presence he is about shortly to appear that he may go through the severe trial he is called upon to endure the calm and dignified manner of the brave colonel rebuked the officious priests and they returned without venturing to utter any of the contemptuous remarks which they had bestowed on his less polished fellow-sufferers crowds collected in the streets to see the mournful procession pass most of the englishmen walked boldly on with heads erect and undismayed countenances many of them indeed scarcely believed that the government would venture to put them to death the natives on the contrary fully aware of the sanguinary disposition of their countrymen expected no mercy but marched on with trembling knees and downcast countenances expecting the fate which awaited them they had been captured in open rebellion attempting to overthrow the government and were conscious how they themselves would have treated their enemies had they exchanged places the crowd gathered rapidly eager to indulge themselves of the spectacle which was about to take place suddenly there came a booming sound of a gun across the harbour followed by the thunder of several others one at short intervals much louder than the rest the colonel and captain crowhurst turned their heads those guns come from vessels in action said tom perhaps one is an english ship if so she is sure to give the dons a drubbing 
some of the crowd hastened to the harbour to see what had taken place the soldiers advanced with their prisoners at a more rapid rate than before they quickly reached an open place just outside the town here they stopped and presently several officers came on the field the prisoners were marched a short distance to the front of the troops who extended their line on either side of them an officer of rank with his staff now rode up colonel o'regan on seeing him stepped forward general carmona he said i have been your enemy and have no hope of mercy at our hands i therefore do not ask it for myself i speak for these men who if they have broken your laws did so in ignorance still more earnestly do i entreat you not to injure these two young english officers who as i informed your commodore are entirely guiltless they were saved at sea from a wreck by the brig on board which i was a passenger and if you put them to death you will bring the vengeance of their countrymen on your head you may have some excuse for shooting me but you will have none if you murder them for murder it will be whatever you may call it this address seemed to have some effect on the general who however issued no counter orders to the officers charged with the execution of the prisoners the colonel with the two masters and their four mates together with the principal natives all of whom appeared to be of the rank of officers were placed in a row when several soldiers came behind them for the purpose of binding handkerchiefs over their eyes the colonel turned round to the men who were about to perform that office for him with a calm smile i desire to gaze my last on the blue sky above us he said gently let me at least die like a soldier it is the only favour i ask his companions followed the colonel's example and begged to be allowed to die with eyes unbound the general now ordered the officer in command of the firing party to hurry his preparations as you have so many to dispose of it would have made shorter work had you placed them all together he shouted out the rest of the prisoners had in the meantime been led on one side to await their turn the firing party now advanced the doomed men gazed at them with pale though undaunted countenances the commanding officer in a loud harsh voice gave the usual order make ready present then came the fatal word fire some fell forward shot dead others were struggling and writhing on the ground colonel o'regan alone was standing upright it was but for a moment he was seen to stagger forward then to fall heavily on his face regardless of the danger they ran from the firing party who advanced to plunge their bayonets into the bodies of those who still had life in them tom and archy dashed forward with the idea of helping their unfortunate friend they attempted to raise him but the expression of his countenance and the blood oozing from a wound in his breast told them but too truly that all was over and had not their guards who were alarmed on their own account at having allowed them to escape dragged them back they would probably have been bayoneted on the spot just then an officer who came galloping up with looks of consternation on his countenance informed the general that his corvette the chief vessel of his navy with which he believed that he could defy the world had struck her flag to a british brig of war and that his brig had been sent to the bottom the news produced an electric effect on him and his officers he at once gave orders that the surviving english prisoners should be conducted back to jail under charge of a small body of troops while the rest were marched off to the batteries we have had a narrow escape said tom to archy not at the time aware to what cause they were indebted for their preservation we ought indeed to be thankful but i would have given anything to have saved the colonel poor miss o'regan what will she do with no one to look after her but we will do our best answered archy and as i have a notion that she will some day be my cousin i have a sort of right you know to watch over her but in the meantime what shall we say to that poor young lady asked tom i haven't the heart to tell her that her father has been shot answered archy though of course something must be said we must not tell her a falsehood that's certain 
then we must just say that we were marched out into the country when firing was heard which we had no doubt came from an english ship of war and then we were marched back again said tom if she asks any further questions we need not say anything more and perhaps before long we shall all be on board when she will be better able to bear her misfortune than she would be shut up in prison much to their satisfaction the midshipmen were taken back to the room they had before occupied the great drawback however was the fear they felt of being cross-questioned by miss o'regan they had not been there long before they heard the jailer's wife go into her room and they guessed that she would tell the poor girl more than they themselves could venture to do there was a great deal of talking and after some time the old woman went away scarcely had she gone than miss o'regan opened their door i have important news for you she exclaimed in an animated tone and she gave them the information she had just heard that an english brig of war had captured the whole of the cartagenian fleet and that the authorities as well as the people were in a state of the greatest possible alarm and agitation we may expect therefore to be speedily liberated she added my poor father must also be set free she had been so interested in describing what she had heard that she did not make the inquiries they expected and the midshipmen were saved the pain of informing her of her father's death they passed the next two hours in a state of great anxiety at last footsteps were heard and voices coming towards their room their door was thrown open and there stood lieutenant murray gerald desmond needham and several strangers one of whom was in the consular uniform the former giving them a smile of recognition hurried into miss o'regan's room and patty desmond after warmly shaking hands began recounting to them the adventures he and needham had gone through they in return had a sad tale to tell of the events which had lately occurred it was cut short by the reappearance of murray with miss o'regan leaning on his arm followed by polly carrying the box with her mistress's wardrobe now young gentlemen said the consul we have come to conduct you to my house where no one will dare to molest you and i dare say that you will be glad to get out of the prison yes indeed we shall sir answered tom but i should like to wish the jailer's wife good-bye i am sorry to tell you that she and her husband have been dismissed from their post and are now themselves confined in one of the cells in which they have been accustomed to lock up others however i will do my best for them and in a short time there will be another change of government when they will probably be reinstated they are accused of having connived at the escape of your companions and i can probably help them by explaining how it occurred murray had thought it better not to tell stella of her father's death her suspicions however had been aroused and she pathetically begged that she might see him it is impossible answered murray let me entreat you not to inquire further at present and you shall be informed of all that has happened as soon as we reach the consul's house stella was silent the dreadful truth began to dawn on her she dared not ask another question with no small satisfaction the party found themselves outside the prison walls they were not interfered with by the populace who regarded the conqueror of their fleet rather with awe and respect than any vindictive feelings the vice-consul's spanish wife received the young english lady with a kind welcome and did her best to prepare her for the afflicting intelligence she was to hear murray undertook the task her grief was too great for tears i was prepared for it she said at length a fearful foreboding of evil has oppressed me since we sailed from antigua i cannot help thinking that he himself felt that such might too probably be his fate yet he braved it under the belief that he was engaged in the cause of humanity the consolation murray offered was not without its due effect there is one at all events who will take your father's place and joyfully devote his life to your service and to watching over you with the tenderest love he said taking her hand i know it she answered and my father often expressed his satisfaction at the thought that i might some day become your wife stella had another trial to undergo when receiving from tom and archie the last message which her father sent her 
although the consul promised to protect her and the ladies of the family treated her with the greatest sympathy and kindness she was naturally anxious to join her friends in jamaica and murray was also unwilling that she should remain longer on shore than possible there were few places at that time more disorganized and disturbed than cartagena the consul himself and his family indeed were frightened and gladly accepted murray's invitation to take up their quarters on board the supplejack till matters were in a more settled state on shore the consul's boat was in readiness and the whole party were soon assembled on the deck of the brig their departure showed the government that the commander intended to carry out his threat of sending for a fleet to bombard their town should his demands not be complied with another messenger was therefore dispatched to hasten the departure of the captured merchantmen which the wind being favourable within the time allowed were seen entering the harbour as his duty would not allow murray to leave cartagena until he had received instructions from the admiral he determined forthwith to send to sarah jane with an account of the event which had occurred and to ask for instructions as soon as she came to an anchor higson tom and archy with a boat's crew were sent on board great was the midshipmen's delight when they stepped on deck to see master spider on the top of the caboose apparently on excellent terms with his new associates he knew his old friends however at once and came hopping down to greet them with every demonstration of pleasure the brig was in a terribly dirty condition and the furniture of the cabin was considerably damaged while the greater part of her cargo and every article of value had been carried off the native crew was sent on shore and murray picked out the most respectable of her former ship's company with two or three of the best men out of the sloop to man her promising them a handsome reward if they behaved well though he could ill spare higson there was no one else to whom he could entrust the command of her he felt bound also to send the three midshipmen back to their ships and the confidence he had in needham made him resolve to send him and in addition he picked out four good men from the supplejack i hope we have made up a tolerable ship's company for you higson he said keep a watchful eye over them and do not trust them too much they have ample inducement to behave well but they have been so long i suspect engaged in lawless pursuits that it is impossible to say what tricks they may take it into their heads to play murray was constantly on board the sarah jane endeavouring to restore her cabin to its former state of comfort he felt that stella could not stay on board the supplejack with him and painful as it was to part with her his only course was to send her at once to her friends in jamaica she herself saw the propriety of this and made no demur i can trust you confidently to the care of mr higson and your former young protectors he said as he made the proposal as soon as duty will allow me i hope to return to jamaica and then i trust that nothing will occur to prevent me from making you mine and giving me the right to protect and watch over you scarcely half an hour had elapsed after this before stella was once more on board the sarah jane sail was made the anchor lifted and the brig with a fair wind glided out of the harbour murray continued on board her as far as he could venture to see but as he dared not be long absent from the supplejack he was at length compelled to return End of chapter fourteen section seventeen of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter fifteen part one stella and the midshipmen sail for jamaica in the sarah jane voyage arrival jack's delight at recovering tom stella goes to the bradshaws higson promoted the plantagenet and tudor sail for cartagena they quickly settle all difficulties proceed to the mosquito shore boat expedition up the san juan de nicaragua 
the sarah jane meeting with fine weather and a fair wind glided rapidly across the caribbean sea higson felt proud of his first command and soon gained that self-confidence which long years spent in a subordinate position and had made him doubt that he possessed the midshipmen supported him well and needham who acted as boatswain and a more thorough man-of-war's man never stepped assisted to keep the rest of the crew in good order tom rogers was declared first lieutenant and he walked the deck with all the air and consequence of one he had already become a fair navigator and higson could depend on his calculations gordon was dubbed the master and it was voted that desmond should be second lieutenant i say exclaimed tom we ought to have a doctor and so i propose that we give master spider the rating since we haven't got a better one to fill the post he at all events won't drench his patients with physic and if he has to bleed them he will do it artistically with his teeth so spider was dubbed doctor from henceforth higson appointed archie gordon also to do the duties of purser so that he had plenty of occupation it was impossible to be more attentive to poor miss o'regan than were the young midshipmen or more thoughtful in all they did although she still looked pale she endeavoured to show her gratitude whenever she came on deck by her cheerful conversation and her smile which desmond declared beat everything in the way of sunshine the midshipmen enjoyed the voyage and quickly regained their strength somewhat lost during their imprisonment as to their spirits they were of too buoyant a nature to be kept down the moment the pressure was removed at length the blue mountains beyond the harbour of port royal appeared in sight the sea breeze which still blew fresh wafting the brig rapidly towards the shore miss o'regan with her faithful attendant by her side seated on deck watched with much interest the magnificent view which gradually rose before her eyes the three midshipmen were standing near her i cannot help hoping that the frigate and corvette have been sent to sea if not higson will have pretty soon to give up his command and we three degraded from our rank shall be ignominiously sent back into the midshipmen's berth said tom with a laughable grimace then the sooner we make up our minds to sink into insignificance the better observed desmond who had a telescope to his eye i make out clearly enough the frigate and corvette at anchor however we shall have a jolly time of it giving the other fellows an account of our adventures i vote that we make old scrofton believe that master spider played a gallant part in the capture of the cartagenian fleet and led the boarders when we took the corvette but we didn't board at all in the first place said tom so that won't be true to begin with no but when one's about spinning a yarn it's as well to spin a good one answered desmond to my mind a joke's a joke and a lie's a lie observed tom although it would be very good fun to quiz old scrofton we certainly should not tell him what is not the truth and i won't vote for anything of the sort nor will i observed gordon and after all the adventures we have been preserved from it's time that we should knock off our midshipmen's tricks where should we have been if my cousin murray hadn't come in at the moment he did and so bravely captured the fleet we should to a certainty have been shot as was the poor colonel hush said tom pointing to miss o'regan she may hear us patty desmond looked rather vexed i don't consider humbugging an old boatswain telling a lie as you choose to call it he said turning away truth is truth patty though answered tom i didn't mean to offend you and i dare say we shall get a rise out of old scrofton without descending to falsehood patty's anger was as usual quickly appeased and he joined in the hearty laughter which master spider produced as at that moment he came hopping aft rigged in a white shirt with blue turn-down collar white trousers a straw hat secured to the top of his head and a wooden cutlass made fast to one of his paws and which in his efforts to free himself from it he appeared to be flourishing about as if engaged in mortal combat 
there exclaimed patty if he didn't board the dons he shows that he would have done so if we had run them alongside and he would precious soon have driven them overboard even stella could not help indulging in a smile such as had not for a long time lighted up her countenance while polly clapped her hands and shrieked with laughter gradually the fortifications and buildings of port royal and the long line of the palisades appeared in sight and the brig passing close round the works of fort charles steered in and anchored a short distance from the frigate blue peter was flying from the mastheads of both ships a signal that they were about to put to sea so there was no time to be lost higson ordered a boat to be lowered and leaving the brig in charge of needham accompanied by the three midshipmen pulled alongside the frigate stella naturally preferred remaining on board the brig until she could be conveyed to kingston captain hemming was on shore but mr cherry and jack rogers were on board while adair was seen walking the deck of the corvette a boat coming alongside sir sang out norris addressing jack who was officer of the watch and if i can believe my eyes there's higson with your brother and gordon and patty desmond in her the announcement produced no small excitement on board all who heard it hurrying to have a look at the three long lost midshipmen jack his warm heart beating with joy rushed to the gangway he was soon shaking hands with tom and his companions who were warmly welcomed by their other shipmates spider who had accompanied them made his own way up the side and seated on the hammock nettings holding on by a backstay was received with shouts of laughter by his old friends he chattering away seemingly as glad to see them as they were to greet him singling old ben snatchblock with whom he had been a favourite he sprang on his shoulders and was quickly carried in triumph forward where he was lost to sight among the crew who gathered round him as schoolgirls are wont to do round a small child introduced amongst them higson and the midshipmen were in the meantime relating their adventures as rapidly as their tongues could wag as soon as they had given a brief outline of them they inquired what had occurred during their absence the corvette had been repaired commander babbicome though still as much afraid of the west india climate as at first had not resigned as it was thought he would do her complement had been made up of the crew of two merchant vessels wrecked on the coast with other volunteers and a few hands from the frigate and they were now only waiting the return of captain hemming to proceed to the southward application having been made by her britannic majesty's consul at bluefields on the mosquito shore for the assistance of some ships of war to protect british interests in that part of the world a variety of outrages and insults of which he complained having been offered to englishmen work of some sort it was expected would be cut out for them and all hands were delighted at the thoughts of having something in the way of fighting to do then the sooner i get up to kingston the better exclaimed higson it won't do to be left behind i can't go however without delivering my dispatches to the admiral he accordingly hurried back with the three midshipmen to the brig where jack and adair who were anxious to pay their respects to miss o'regan presently followed they said all that was proper to her regarding her father's death and expressed their hopes that murray would soon return to jamaica and receive his well-earned honours he is sure to be promoted said jack when he is i have great hopes that the admiral will appoint him to the command of the corvette should captain babbicome resign her as i think he is very likely to do for he evidently wishes himself looking after his cows and pigs at home miss o'regan and her attendant with higson and the three midshipmen proceeded up at once to kingston fortunately on landing they met the admiral who was delighted to hear of murray's success i knew the lad would do something if he had the opportunity he exclaimed rubbing his hands and very well he has done it that all must allow he will obtain his promotion and you mr higson may depend on receiving yours 
on being introduced to miss o'regan the old admiral exclaimed you must come up to the pen my dear young lady and remain there till you can communicate with your friends mrs and miss mcalpine will be delighted to see you on your own account and also that of my kinsman lieutenant murray he is an officer in whose welfare i am much interested and i can assure you that he has not disappointed my expectations then turning to the midshipmen he added and you youngsters must come up too the ladies will want you to spin them a yarn about your adventures and i'll take care that the frigate does not sail without you though stella would have gladly set off at once for her relations the bradshaws she could not refuse the admiral's kind invitation he drove her up to the pen where higson and the midshipmen followed stella was kindly received and as little as possible was said to recall the painful scenes she had gone through the admiral with murray's dispatches before him questioned higson as to further particulars and then made the midshipmen recount their adventures to his wife and daughters being especially amused at the way desmond roused up the vice-consul and his household tom ever afterwards declared that he was the most jolly old officer he had ever met with excepting of course admiral triton i see mr higson that lieutenant murray speaks in the highest terms of your bravery and courage in this affair said the admiral i have great pleasure therefore in giving you an acting order as third lieutenant of the plantagenet and i have no doubt that when the affair is known at the admiralty it will be confirmed and i can congratulate you on the step which has been entirely gained by your own merits higson felt his heart jump nearly into his mouth for often before as he had expected promotion he had been disappointed and he had almost given up hopes of obtaining it he thanked the admiral warmly say no more about it mon he answered i wish that i could reward every one on board the supplejack as they deserved you may possibly before long have an opportunity of distinguishing yourself and i am very sure that i shall hear a good account of you captain hemming soon afterwards went up to the pen when he received fresh instruction as to his course of proceeding instead of going direct to nicaragua as he had before been ordered to do he was to touch cartagena to settle the affair of the capture of the cartagenan fleet and the recapture of the merchantman it being considered that a visit of two or three ships of war might somewhat assist in bringing the diplomatic part of the transaction to a satisfactory conclusion when the midshipmen went to wish good-bye to stella she had a letter for murray which she entrusted to archie gordon you may depend on me for delivering it safely for i should otherwise never be able to look my cousin in the face he answered after an early dinner the admiral dismissed them higson wished to get several things in kingston before they returned on board he had also to deliver over the brig to the agent who had to find a fresh crew in lieu of the men-of-war's men and some of the others who volunteered for the frigate it was thus past midnight when they got on board higson received the hearty congratulation of his old messmates as well as those of the midshipmen whose berth he was leaving pardon me mr higson i'm right glad that you've got this step exclaimed nick needham you deserve it that you do though it's not always those who are most deserving that gets their due by daybreak next morning the plantagenet and tudor sailed with the land breeze for the southward about the usual length of time was occupied in the run across the caribbean sea to cartagena the plantagenet hove to outside while captain hemming went on board the tudor which stood into the harbour there lay the little supplejack like a bulldog watching his charge with long tom still pointed at her prize while her young commander ever vigilant walked her deck very great as may be supposed was his delight when he saw the corvette glide up to an anchorage and when captain hemming came on board since the sarah jane sailed i have not once set foot on shore said murray after the first greetings were over 
i acted as i thought for the best and i hoped that the admiral was not inclined to find fault with me for what i have done find fault with you on the contrary my dear fellow he is delighted answered captain hemming he also told me in confidence that you may depend on your promotion by the by your young relative gordon is the bearer of a dispatch which will give you further information i'll leave you to read it while i have a talk with the consul who i see has just come off the dispatch which archy delivered to his cousin need not be made public though it afforded him intense satisfaction the consul after a brief conversation with captain hemming returned on shore to communicate with general carmona it was reported on board that the general had offered as he could not restore the british subjects he had shot to life to give up an equal number of natives to be dealt with in the same manner should the english commander be so disposed although he talked a little big about being compelled to give up the two merchant vessels which had been legally captured he was glad enough to drop the subject on condition that his corvette and schooners were restored to him while he promised in future never to shoot hang or imprison any british subject without a legal trial thus the matter being settled long tom was once more housed and the supple jack sailed out of the harbour murray not supposing that anything of consequence was likely to take place was much disappointed when instead of proceeding to jamaica he was ordered to join the other ships on their way to nicaragua both the three lieutenants and the three midshipmen though on the same service were now separated gordon having remained on board the frigate desmond having joined the corvette while tom continued with his brother various were the surmises as to the sort of service in which they were to be engaged all they knew was that the president of an insignificant republic having ventured to beard the english he was to be punished accordingly and brought to reason how this was to be done was the question as the ships could not get near enough to the shore to batter down any of his towns captain hemming had however received a sufficient information regarding the interior of the country to be enabled to form his plans the ships having reached the neighbourhood of blue fields on the mosquito shore a pilot vessel from one of the numerous keys situated off that dangerous coast came out the pilot being taken on board they proceeded with the lead going to the anchorage off the town which is situated on the border of a wide extending plain out of which several volcanoes could be seen continually puffing forth smoke the british consul at once came on board and expressed his satisfaction at their arrival there will be some work for you to do captain hemming he observed a certain colonel salas belonging to the precious republic of nicaragua who is at the head of a band of ruffians has carried off two persons from san juan falsely accused of breaking the laws of the country and he has besides offered numerous other insults to the british flag a short time only was spent in making the necessary preparations the consul mr wilmot being a man of action was eager himself to proceed with the expedition accompanied by a spirited young man mr halliday who also begged leave to join the party they offered the use of their own boat manned by natives which was at once accepted the following morning the vessels got under way and proceeded towards the mouth of the san juan river blue fields it should be understood is one of the chief towns belonging to the dark-skinned monarchs of the mosquito shore and Greytown, at the entrance of the last mentioned river is the capital at noon time the following day the expedition arrived off that not over delightful spot it contains about two thousand inhabitants and is situated on perfectly level ground so completely closed in by impassable forests or water that a walk in any direction is impossible unless along the sea beach the inhabitants consist of a few englishmen and a greater number of germans and americans employed in the engrossing work of dollar-getting 
the grog shops however drive a most flourishing trade but few natives live in the town and from the colour of those seen paddling about in their canoes it is evident that they are a mixture of the mulatto and indian they came alongside the ships eager to dispose of the turtle which they are chiefly engaged in catching and to sell a few eggs and chickens they were merry fellows most of them speaking english as they were ready to take any price offered they soon got rid of their merchandise the consul advised captain hemming to be prepared for hostilities and as he was too wise an officer to despise a foe he ordered all the boats of the squadron to be got ready for the expedition no one was allowed to go on shore indeed scarcely a place on the face of the globe can have fewer attractions than greytown the seamen were busily employed in sharpening cutlasses and examining their pistols and the soldiers in furbishing up their arms ready for active service not a breath of wind stirred the glass-like surface of the water the sun came down with intense heat making the pitch in the seams of the decks bubble and squeak so paddy desmond declared even those most inured to tropical suns felt the heat which even the awnings stretched over the quarter-deck could scarcely mitigate poor captain babbicome was seen pacing up and down with a large bandana in his hand puffing and blowing and wiping the perspiration from his brow he received but little consolation when he heard terence remark that it would be hotter still up the river oh dear oh dear what shall i do he exclaimed if this continues i shall be reduced to a skeleton the doctor strongly advised him to remain on board a sunstroke would finish you sir he observed and you would be a loss to the service still commander babbicome was too brave a man to give in willingly even when captain hemming directed him to remain in charge of the squadron during his absence he begged to be allowed should he feel better to proceed up the river act as you think best should you recover sufficiently to stand the fatigue of course i shall be glad to have your assistance answered his superior officer murray in the meantime took his place as second in command twelve boats were prepared for the expedition consisting of the ship's launches and barges the consul's boat a spare pinnace and the captain's gigs the next morning at daybreak the boats shoved off from the ship's sides saluted with loud cheers by those who remained on board captain hemming and murray went in their respective gigs and jack who had command of the pinnace took tom with him while desmond accompanied adair in one of the barges the soldiers and the marines were distributed among the boats the whole including officers bluejackets and soldiers mustered upwards of two hundred and fifty men the two gigs accompanied by the consul's boat went ahead they had not proceeded far before they felt the strength of the current for although the river was wide it was shallow and so great was the mass of water coming down that it ran with the rapidity of a mill-stream the men had to bend to their oars with might and main and even then the heavier boats in several places scarcely seemed at times to go ahead though the sun struck down with intense heat the gallant blue jackets took no notice of it nor relaxed their efforts but hour after hour pulled on encouraged by their officers in some places the water was so shallow that the boats could with difficulty move along and frequently they had to shove off till another channel was found undaunted however they laboured on till midday when they landed at the most convenient spot to be found on the banks of the river to dine and recruit their exhausted strength an hour only was allowed for rest and once more they embarked and toiled on as before the forest on both sides of the river came close down to the water's edge the lofty trees towering high above their heads shutting out everything behind here and there a few clearings were seen with huts and other buildings tenanted by settlers and now and then a native in his light canoe paddled by but few inhabitants were seen the views as they proceeded consisted chiefly of the tumbling waters and the forests as the hand of nature had left them at length night approached 
the captain gave the order to land and the hardy crews their strength taxed to the uttermost pulled in quickly to a somewhat more open spot than was usually seen on the banks where they might find room to bivouac for the night the boats were made fast and all hands leaped on shore and began with their axes to cut away the underwood a space sufficient for the object was soon cleared the camp-fires were lighted pots and pans brought on shore and the men told off to act as cooks set to work to boil the coffee and cocoa and warm up the messes of turtle which had been prepared the only spots where they could rest with anything like comfort was round the fires the thick clouds of smoke rising from which helped to keep off the myriads of mosquitoes which forthwith commenced an onslaught on them the officers assembled in the neighbourhood of one of the fires while the soldiers and sailors gathered round the others a person ignorant of the cause might have supposed that every man of the party had been seized with st vitus dance not a man could retain his seat or keep his hands quiet for a moment for while he tried with one hand to get his food or a cup to his mouth the other was employed in slapping right and left now at his cheek now at his other hand or at his feet in vain endeavours to destroy his persevering foes for the instant a wreath of smoke blew to one side a whole host of ferocious insects darted forward to assail their victims on the other cigars and pipes were quickly lighted in the hopes of driving off the pests but in vain the fumes of tobacco had but little effect for if a puff drove them off a man's nose in an instant they attacked some other part of his body in spite of this inconvenience murray had again to give the account of his recent exploit while the midshipmen recounted for the twentieth time their adventures and imprisonment in cartagena End of section seventeen section eighteen of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter fifteen part two night encampment visit of a puma a chase scenery of the river birds and monkeys voyage continued an unpleasant bed on an ant hill approaching the enemy a sad accident alarm the captain attempts to rescue the drowning men does not return no sooner had night closed down on the camp than cries of all descriptions came forth from the forest the croaking of frogs the chirping of crickets the howling of monkeys mingled with strange groans and shrieks which made the seamen draw closer together some even among the stoutest hearted declaring that without doubt the place was haunted while many a brave tar cast a glance over his shoulder expecting to see some fierce creature stalk out from among the trees at last captain hemming gave the order for all hands to turn in with such shelter as they had provided and to get some sleep to prepare themselves for the work of the next day some went on board the boats hoping to be free of the bites of the mosquitoes though hopeless were their efforts to escape from their tormentors the three lieutenants seated themselves side by side while their young relatives the three midshipmen had collected not far off well i suppose we must go to sleep said tom rogers stretching himself out he had rolled up his flushing coat to serve as a pillow and prepared to enjoy as much comfort as circumstances would allow faith we have music at all events to lull us to sleep exclaimed gerald desmond but i wish those beasts would put a stopper to their singing though they may sing as long as they like provided they don't bite remarked gordon following his companion's example in a short time the whole camp was at rest with the exception of the few sentries the only sounds being the mysterious ones which came at intervals from the forest and the loud snoring of some of the soldiers and seamen the fire still kept blazing casting a lurid glare over the foaming waters 
as they rushed past on the tall trees of the dark forest on the other side and on the figures of the officers and men stretched in various attitudes on the ground tom rogers suddenly awoke a mosquito had fixed its sharp proboscis in his nose he had dreamed that a serpent had got hold of it starting up he saw between the trees near which he and his companions lay a pair of bright eyes glaring at him they were contained in the head of a creature which appeared crouching down as if about to make a spring towards him he knew it at once to be a puma the so-called lion of south america leaping to his feet he shouted to his companions to be on their guard the next instant it seemed that the animal would be upon them his voice awoke the lieutenants and the other officers who had been sleeping near at hand and quickly brought a sentry to the spot the man catching sight of the puma fired his musket the report of course aroused the whole camp a lion a lion shouted several voices and in an instant the greater part of the blue jackets were in hot chase after the animal which of course rapidly bounded away far out of sight they would have quickly lost themselves in the forest had not the captain and officers called them back and ordered them to lie down and go to sleep again the sentries were in consequence of the visit they had received doubled and cautioned to keep a better lookout not only for human foes but for any of the savage denizens of the forest which might attempt to pay them another visit at early dawn the camp was again astir and as tom and the other midshipmen opened their eyes they saw grinning at them from among the branches a number of little hairy faces chattering and grinning they belonged to troops of monkeys who had come attracted by curiosity to look at the strangers invading their domains as soon however as the men began to move about they took fright and scrambled off to a safer distance just then loud caws were heard and several flights of magnificent coloured macaws flew across the stream cocoa and other beverages having been served out and rapidly swallowed the party embarked and once more the toils of the day began it was harder work than ever the boats had frequently to pass right up rapids and among rocks and sand-banks thus it was only by the greatest exertion that the heavier boats could be forced along except that the toil was greater and the heat more intense there was but little variation from the events of the preceding day whenever they neared the banks troops of monkeys appeared in the branches of the lofty trees chattering and shaking their heads or screaming in anger at this invasion of their territory flights of macaws and other birds of gorgeous plumage flew overhead generally in pairs and here and there perched on the lower branches were seen huge white ducks which nodded their heads and gabbled as the boats passed slowly by them among the monkeys of which various species were seen were several little congo apes who in their anger attempted to roar like lions affording infinite amusement to the crews i say patty cried tom rogers to desmond their boats being at that time close to each other we must catch one of those fellows he would make a good playmate to spider i suspect that old scrofton will declare that he is an embryo lion i wonder how many thousand years it will take before he will turn into one nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine young gentlemen cried the boatswain who was in charge of one of the launches with troops and being at the time close astern overheard the question in my opinion how some endeavour it doesn't take half the time for a spider tail to turn into a powder monkey but i'll see what my book says about it when we get back to the ship there was of course a general laugh among the boat's crews jack did not think it necessary to interfere though he suspected that had they not been on duty the boatswain would have used the word midshipman in lieu of powder monkey every now and then the boats grated against a snag which reminded them of the danger which they would have to encounter when returning the rocks and snags could not as they were then steering do them much injury but it would be a very different matter when coming down even the gig's crews found it trying work at best 
sometimes it appeared as if it would be impossible to get up the heavier boats unless they could be warped still by the determination and perseverance of the crews all difficulties were overcome and after an hour's rest for dinner under the shade of the trees they pulled on again much in the same fashion till near nightfall they then landed at a deserted clearing and congratulated themselves at finding a place so well suited for their encampment as they were getting nearer the territory of the enemy sentries were placed at the edge of the forest and cautioned to be vigilant to prevent a surprise jack and terence who had landed with their fowling pieces were fortunate in shooting a capybora a rodent animal as large as a middling-sized pig soon afterwards they knocked over a couple of little peccaries which furnished a welcome addition to the supper to all hands the officers and men collected as before round their respective fires the mosquitoes were somewhat less troublesome or perhaps the people were more inured to their attacks it was however necessary to sit within the limits of the clouds of smoke to enjoy any comfort songs were sung stories told and all hands were apparently enjoying themselves mr wilmot made himself very agreeable and his companion became a great favourite from his fund of humour and his frank and unassuming manners do you really think that this colonel and his men will give us anything to do asked jack of mr wilmot the fellows are ferocious enough when they fight among themselves and brave as such fellows generally are though they would not venture to resist us with double our forces if they were on equal terms but if they thought that they could take us at an advantage they would probably hold out and afford us some trouble answered the consul i some time ago visited the fort of serapaqui in which the colonel and his troops were posted and it is a remarkably strong place standing on a point of land about fifty feet in height which projects directly into the river while behind the fort is a dense forest which completely defends the rear in front is an abatis formed of large trees with their trunks fixed in the ground and their branches projecting into the river so that it would be impossible for boats to reach the bank or for men to land exposed to fire the defences of the fort consist of six angular stockaded entrenchments formed of exceedingly hard wood they are eight feet high and four feet thick one side of each stockade looking towards the river and the other down the reach the only landing-place is commanded by the principal stockade and guns have also been placed on it this landing-place you will understand is above the stockades and as the current there runs nearly five knots an hour we shall have to pass the stockades exposed all the time to the fire from the batteries before we can descend to the landing-place the reach at the head of which the fort is situated is about a mile and a half long while the forest comes down on either side close to the water and affords an almost impenetrable shelter to a concealed foe i tell you this that you may know what we have to encounter but at the same time i am sure that the gallantry of british officers and men will overcome difficulties of far greater magnitude why i wished to accompany you was that i might render all the services in my power captain hemming thanked the consul for his bold determination adding i trust that we shall not disappoint you mr wilmot and that you will live to share such laurels as we may gain i hope so too captain but i do not shut my eyes to the dangers which we may have to meet was the answer that consul is a brave fellow whispered tom to archy i look upon those as the bravest who know the full extent of the danger they may have to encounter and with calm determination go into it mr wilmot had an awning rigged to his boat and had brought mattresses and pillows so that he and his friend made it their sleeping-place the other boats contained also a few occupants but the larger number of the party preferred sleeping on shore where they could stretch their limbs they having discovered that the mosquitoes annoyed them as much on board the boats as on the banks of the river tom and his companions had noticed a mound of no great height 
at a little distance from their camp-fire and they agreed that the ground at its base would afford them a comfortable sleeping-place as soon therefore as the order was given to cease talking and singing and go to sleep they carried their coats and blankets to the spot and rolled themselves up expecting to pass a quiet night as they could not be overheard they talked on for some time as midshipmen are accustomed to do under similar circumstances then first one and then the other began to feel drowsy and lying down forgot all sublunary matters tom had not however been long asleep before he dreamed that he was attacked by a host of stag beetles assailing every part of his body and that though he slashed at them with his cutlass they came on in greater numbers than ever till he felt ready to turn tail and bolt suddenly he awoke and finding that the sensation he had experienced in his dreams were a dreadful reality began to jump and beat himself furiously his companions just then started up from the same cause and also began jumping twisting turning and striking their bodies and legs with their hands as if they had gone mad i'll be eaten up entirely if i don't get rid of these beasts exclaimed paddy desmond jumping and beating himself more violently than before their cries awoke their nearest neighbours while the sentries rushed forward expecting to find that a band of indians had secretly introduced themselves into the camp jack and terence were really alarmed believing that the youngsters had been bitten by a snake or attacked by another puma nothing however could be found on them till some brands brought from the fire threw a light on the subject when it was discovered that they had chosen the neighbourhood of a nest of ants of a species addicted to nocturnal rambles when they first lay down the ants were quiet in their abode and remained so till their usual time for sallying forth in search of prey the first objects they had met with were the bodies of the three midshipmen on whom they would have undoubtedly feasted till they had consumed them to their bones had not their sharp pincers aroused their victims the midshipmen found it no easy job to rid themselves of the fearful little pests even with the assistance of their friends and they had literally to strip off their clothes and capture each creature singly and throw it into the fire before they were got rid of one of the surgeons taking compassion on them produced some ointment which allayed the irritation from which they were suffering they were not the only people whom the ants had attacked and complaints piteous and loud came from all parts of the camp of the attacks made by the fiery little pests many of the men however appeared bite-proof and only growled and swore at having their slumbers disturbed we have however learnt a lesson and i vote that in future we look out for ants nests before settling on our camping-ground observed archie gordon with his usual gravity as they once more lay down on the other side of the fire at a respectful distance from their former resting-place i'd sooner face an electric eel or a boa constrictor than an army of those diabolical little pests exclaimed desmond who had suffered even more than his companions you may tackle them but i defy any one except perhaps spider to defeat their attacks and he would have to keep his paws pretty active to catch them i wish that we had him with us groaned tom i am still itching and smarting all over and they are at me again i am sure of it a big ant-eater would help us more effectually observed gordon he is a curious creature with a thick bushy tail and a pointed snout in which he has a long tongue to enable him to lick up an army of ants and swallow them down at a gulp i wonder that the ants are such fools as to come out of their castles then remarked desmond the ant-eater does not wait for them to do that for he has got powerful claws with which he pulls down their castles and when they come out to repair the breaches he sticks out his tongue and captures a whole army at once answered gordon faith then i wish that we could have a few such creatures to inspect our camp in future before we lie down to rest said desmond silence there you youngsters cried an officer if you can't go to sleep take a round turn of your tongues the hint was not neglected and notwithstanding the irritation they were suffering the midshipmen were very soon snoozing away as soundly as any one every night similar scenes occurred and during the day except when stopping for dinner the boat's crews pulled on with as much vigour and resolution as at first 
at length after a pull of not less than seventy-two hours the boat's crews had the satisfaction of hearing that they were only two or three miles from the fort in which the nicaraguan forces were posted a somewhat limited space only could be found on the shore for their encampment so that a greater number than usual took up their quarters in the boats as may be supposed a careful search was made for ants nests rattlesnakes holes and the abodes of any other creatures likely to disturb them a larger number of sentries than usual were also posted round the camp and directed to keep a vigilant watch while one of the gigs under charge of higson with needham as coxswain was sent on some way ahead to keep a lookout for the enemy should they take it into their heads to descend the stream and make a night attack on the camp a pleasant supper was made on shore though singing and loud talking were forbidden lest any stragglers from the fort might hear them and give notice of their approach the thick forest however effectually screened their fires and the smoke could not be seen at night mr wilmot spoke hopefully of the work before them he had little doubt that the nicaraguan commander would yield immediately he saw the force brought against him though he probably at present did not believe that such heavy boats as theirs could be forced up the stream mr halliday was more silent than was his wont some of his friends inquired what was the matter i felt the heat very great during the day he answered but i dare say that when our work is accomplished and we are pulling down the stream i shall recover my spirits mr wilmot had kindly invited the three midshipmen to take up their quarters on board his boat having fitted up a place amidships for them here at all events they might be free from the ants and as to the mosquitoes they were nearly inured to them at an earlier hour the usual all hands not on the watch went to sleep with the exception of those in mr wilmot's boat he and his friends sat up some time talking together but what they said neither tom nor his companions could hear as they themselves were soon lulled to sleep by the loud rushing of the strong current which swept by the boat tom was suddenly awakened by a loud cry and an exclamation from mr wilmot where is halliday and the next instant he exclaimed good heavens he is overboard i must save him and before he could have had time for thought he himself plunged into the boiling waters and swam towards his friend who was being carried rapidly down by the current the midshipman being aroused tom who saw what had happened was about to plunge into the stream to try and assist the consul when gordon more prudent held him back exclaiming you will be drowned my dear fellow if you do tom had happily thus more time than mr wilmot had taken to reflect on the fearful danger he would run their cries awoke captain hemming who immediately arousing his men slipped his cable and pulled down the river in the hope of rescuing his drowning friends the whole camp and those in the boats were now awake and on learning what had happened looked anxiously out for the return of the captain's gig the only hope being that he might discover and pick up the two gentlemen before the waters had overwhelmed them the time went by and every one felt that their gallant leader and his crew were running great danger in venturing down the stream at night several of the officers indeed expressed their fears that his boat might strike against a snag or be dashed on the rocks and all on board lose their lives among those on shore several endeavoured to make their way along the bank but were soon stopped by the impenetrable jungle and compelled to return no other boat could venture this to slip her moorings adair had command of the sternmost one of the squadron his old shipmate ben snatchblock who was with him roused by the shouts of those ahead as he sprung up caught sight of a person rapidly carried astern of the boat i'll try and save him whoever he is he exclaimed and before adair could warn him of his danger he plunged overboard into the boiling water though a powerful man and a bold swimmer he in vain attempted to overtake the person he had seen passing and struggling for life whoever it might be it was the same to him on he went and just as he fancied that he was about to succeed the person he had gone to save sank drawn down by an eddy which very nearly sucked him also into its vortex he's gone poor fellow he's gone his voice was heard exclaiming though he could not be seen directly afterwards the captain's gig passed adair's boat she was also soon lost to sight adair hailed and told them to look out for ben but whether or no they had succeeded in picking up the gallant fellow he could not tell and with the rest 
was long left in doubt as to what had happened the accident had caused all caution to be forgotten and murray and the other officers expected that their cries and shouts must have been heard by any scouts which might have been sent out from the fort he therefore warned the sentries to be on the alert and ordered the men to keep their arms ready for immediate action the unaccountable and sad accident threw a gloom over the spirits both of officers and men and but few went again to sleep during the remainder of the night the next day they would probably be engaged with the enemy and who could tell whose fate it might be to fall to pass slowly up against the rapid stream with both its banks affording an almost impenetrable shelter to a concealed foe was likely to cost them many lives and from the account they had heard of the strong position of the fort they were aware that it would give them severe work to capture still it was to be done and no one doubted that it would be done whatever might be the sacrifice the more reflective had their minds fully occupied and all were in a state of anxiety on account of their captain and the persons he had risked his own safety to rescue from destruction adair who heard what ben had cried out had little hopes that he would succeed and was afraid also that his old shipmate had lost his life at dawn murray had all hands roused up that they might get ready to start should the captain unfortunately have lost his life the command would devolve on him and he resolved to do his best to secure the success of the expedition End of chapter fifteen